Uh, hello, welcome to Stanford Law School. My name is Robert Garcia. I am the Senior Symposium Editor of the Stanford Law Review for Volume 64. We are very excited to see you all here today. Um, this is going to be a very, very interesting discussion, as you can see already outside. Um, first, I want to thank the Center for Internet and Society for co-sponsoring this event with us. We couldn't have done it without them. Um, and the topic of privacy is, is really ripe for discussion right now. We've seen in the news, we've got changes in privacy policies, drones, and the like. Um, so we hope that you will enjoy this discussion um, and enjoy this debate. Um, but before we get started, I just want to talk to you about a few things. Um, as you can see here, we decided to do something a little different. As opposed to publishing a print symposium issue, we decided to put our articles online this year. Um, they're in a, a user-friendly, reader-friendly format. They're only about 2,000 words, so they're not like these guys. So, uh, we hope uh, everybody will enjoy them and they're in their new format. And we have six articles, so we have the three published right now, and three more will be published by the time, uh, probably about next week or so. Um, there's another talk on drones in an international context happening next week. Uh, on Monday, February 6th at 2, at, at 12.45 p.m. So I use them to publish our conference in a while. Um, and we hope to see you at tomorrow's events as well. The full agenda is located inside your program book. Um, if you do come, and we hope you do, just hold on to that book because uh, we're trying to save trees. And uh, yes, don't want to be visible. So just hold on to those and read those tomorrow. Uh, Chief Judge Alex Kaczynski uh, of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals will be giving the keynote, and he recently declared that the Fourth Amendment is dead. So it'll be interesting to see what he has to say, given the new developments. Um, MCLE forms. For those of you who need MCLE credit, uh, there is an evaluation form that you need to return to us. Um, we'll put out boxes at the end of the uh, talk, so feel free to just drop those in on the way out. Um, and about tomorrow's events, parking might be a little difficult. We're fortunate this is an evening event, so um, parking is free after four. So get here early to sort of prepare for that. Um, bathrooms, men's bathroom is men's bathroom is behind me. Women's bathrooms are above and below on the second and in the basement. Um, and before I turn it over to Ryan, I just needed to say a few quick thank yous. Uh, thank you very much to our programs group, but I don't see any of them here. Trish Gertrude, Karen Lee, Jody Kerrigan, and Jackie Del Barrio. They were my heroes. Uh, I've been doing them. Jillian Del Pozo, who's running around. Uh, she's in charge of facilities. Thank you very much. AV, Sandra, and everybody else in the team. Thank you so much. Uh, in CIS, Elena Adolfo. Oh, there's Joe back here, our tech guy. Thank you so much. Um, and our board members, John, Cheryl, Colin, Andrew, Laura, Harker, Steph, Adam, Rose, and James. Thank you for all of your support. You guys. Um, and also, Milena, who is uh, extra, so she can't be here. She helps sort of uh, plan this as well. Uh, Denise Drake and her husband, they're taking you know, pictures for Laura. Thank you. Uh, Stanford Law School, and especially Dean Kramer and Julie Yee, thank you for all of your support. And our sponsors, Sullivan and Cromwell, and the Royce and Clifton, thank you for your support as well. And uh, the MLB company, thank you so, so much, Dr. Stephen Morris, for providing our drones. Can we just give Dr. Stephen Morris a round of applause? Um, and afterwards, you're more than welcome to view the drones. They're located in the rotunda outside, and there'll be a top show reception with live reports as well. Uh, but most importantly, I have to thank Ryan Kalo, who is our, our privacy expert at the Center for Internet Society. Thank you so much for your patience and your ideas. Um, we were, I, I approached Ryan back in probably August. Like, well, let's do this, it's a great topic. I think it's right for discussion. Um, and he obviously said, yes, of course I'd love to do it. Um, so thank you, Ryan. Um, Ryan Kalo runs the research around privacy and robotics here, including the disclosure by design and legal aspects of autonomous driving projects. Prior to joining the law school in 2008, Ryan was an associate at Covington and Burling LLP, which or where he advised companies on issues of data security, privacy, and telecommunications. And without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Ryan. Thanks. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Uh, um, 
Yeah, great introduction. So, um, drones, right? <laughs> like, who would have thought, right? I mean, uh, you know, I, I remember hearing this statistic uh, back, back in March where um, the Air Force announced that they had just, just one branch of the military, that they had actually hit a million combat hours with, with drones. And I just was blown away by that. And I thought, gosh, I wonder whether we're ever going to start to use them in, in the United States and what effect that might have. And lo and behold, uh, that is starting to take place. And so today's discussion is really going to center around not the military use of drones, which is extensive and well understood. A great book to read about that when you um, P.W. Singer's Wired for War. Um, but really, we're going to talk about the use of drones right here in the United States. Um, in order to talk about that issue, we have just, I mean, totally a combination of lucked out and, and, and looked hard. We found just amazing people to be able to tell us about the domestic use of drones and some of the great promise that this technology has and some of the perils. Um, and so immediately to my left um, is uh, Dr. Stephen Morris. I won't get into a long introduction because you have the material in your, in your packets, but um, I mean, among other things, uh, Stephen is a graduate of Stanford. He has a master's, a PhD. Uh, he did a postdoc all here at Stanford uh, University. It's actually a very heavy uh, Stanford panel, it turns out. But, uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and, the, and has been working on uh, UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, for, for quite some time. Um, also spent some time, I believe, as an engineer at, uh, at Boeing, uh, at Lockheed Martin, um, and has a company uh, that actually develops and, I guess, leases and sells and maintains from. Um, and we're, and as, uh, as Rob mentioned, managed to bring a couple of them here and they're in the courtyard, which helps to dramatize this technology to some extent. Um, and then to his left, we have uh, Catherine Crump, who actually is also an alumnus of, uh, turns out, the law school. Um, and she works at the ACLU, in the national uh, office of the ACLU. And she has been a, a close student of this technology and, in fact, co authored a report. Uh, that, that the ACLU put out, uh, I guess with Jay Stanley, right, um, on the domestic use of drones, um, and has been uh, basically speaking on this topic uh, to broadly in the media, um, and uh, quickly becoming a, an authority on, on this subject as an emerging technology as well. Um, and so we really, really managed to grab, grab a couple of people to, to patch this issue out. It's exciting to me personally, I have to understand, uh, because I'm the director, as you heard, for privacy and for robotics, right? And like the domestic use of drones sort of perfectly aligns my interests. Like o overlapping is one of the one places where, where that's the case. Um, and so it's very exciting for me to be able to, to moderate this. Um, and so thank you everybody for coming. One, one quick question I want to ask, uh, I've been asking if this is a CIS and other events like these. How, how many of you are trained primarily as lawyers? Okay, and, and how many of you have some other technological team, like as engineers or other kind of thing? Yeah, so this number is growing and growing and growing at our events, and has hit, you know, 50% in some of them. It's really great. Thanks so much for, for coming. We're really, really glad to be able to get this interdisciplinary perspective on this issue. Okay, so I'm going to start with you, Steve. Um, I, you know, I, this issue has been so visible lately, um, with the military use of drones, with domestic use of drones being ever more, um, uh, ever more sort of likely scenario, it seems. Uh, but you've been working on this technology for, for a long time. Um, I mean, first of all, how, how long have you been working? Uh, well, uh, probably since 1987. Yeah, 87, yeah. But back at that time, there was no GPS, no micro-miniature cameras. So it, a UAV back then was a, a research aircraft for doing uh, advancement of aeronautic sciences but it still had a computer on board. And then in the late 90s, the possibility of making small autonomous airplanes came about, and that's when I uh, switched to full-time work on the development and manufacture of uh, small drones. That's, that's the field that my company focuses on mostly. So how did you get involved, in, I mean, how did you get interested in this technology back then before it was really on anyone's radar? Uh, well, for me, it wasn't so much a matter of choice as necessity, because I been building model airplanes since I was three years old, and basically my destiny in life was something to do with airplanes, preferably. 
somehow related to model airplanes, and luckily it became possible to make what is essentially a really fancy model airplane that somebody might want to buy. <laughs> and uh, that's, you know, so, so, so for me it's just a, a way of finding what I, what I was only uh, basically obsessed with doing and making money off of it. Um, but in a more pragmatic sense, the confluence of technology and need in the late 90s was perfect. Uh, the internet was growing by leaps and bounds. People were, you know, search engines, there, there were more search engines than primarily Google at that time. And from my somewhat naive perspective, I saw the internet as this information hungry, uh, economic and uh, interesting machine that needed stuff put into it. And what was missing was uh, the aerial perspective. It had been about 100 years since the Wright brothers first flew, and yet most people could not, on demand, get an airborne perspective of their surroundings. So my company's goal was to provide airborne access to information. That's what I saw as the missing link and with the benefit in an internet-driven economy. So uh, we got into all of that, and uh, this was you know, before the 9-11 attacks, and at that time, there were local laws for operating these things have a lot of loopholes in them. You could basically build what was essentially a model airplane operating below certain altitudes, and there wasn't a clear law that prevented you from flying that over large distances, taking photos, doing real business type operation. Um, that has since changed dramatically. So uh, I identified that and decided to exploit that loophole and essentially build these uh, robotic model airplanes that could ideally be deployed in large numbers, operated by very few operators. So you have a good economic advantage, just a couple people operating 10, 20, maybe 100 aircraft, and gathering information over uh, cities, uh, agricultural areas, traffic monitoring, all, we can go into the details of what really the, the, the applications are, but I, I just saw too many possibilities and uh, a lot of opportunity at that point. I do actually want to get into some of your ideas about what the interesting use cases are. Um, before I do that, so was the was the military really interested at this time? Uh, was law enforcement really interested, or was it just researchers? Um, I was approached by people who were doing precision agriculture, and it alerted me to the fact that uh, there was development of GPS guided tractors, and that they needed uh, airborne information for dispensing pesticides, water, uh, getting you know rid of insect infestations and high value crops. And I didn't realize that there was this confluence of ground robotics and potentially this airborne robotics, where you know, I'd have my airplane working over agricultural areas. And that's, you know, when you get into a business initially, you want a bread and butter application, something that's the equivalent of mowing your lawn and getting paid a lot of money to do it. That's what aerial imaging is like, using this airplane with a camera to mow out areas of uh, high resolution images. So that looked like an initial early application. The, the military applications sort of came out of when the uh, predator drones were being used by the CIA, people started to hear more and more about what they could do. Then the demand for drones on all different sizes and capabilities came about. And companies like uh, Aero Environment in Simi Valley, which had, had an electric powered hand launched aircraft on the market for quite some time, all of a sudden saw increased demand and interest. And now they are the largest manufacturer of UAVs in the United States, but they make very small ones, so they're not the most, uh, they're not the economically the largest uh, generator of income. Uh, Northrop Grumman is, and they make, the, probably Northrop Grumman on the other hand makes the fewest number of UAVs, but they're the biggest. It just costs a lot of money. I, I, just, I just learned more about drones in the last couple seconds than I have. <laughs> um, so, so, okay, so what, okay, so we got, um, we have precision agriculture, as you were referring to, I guess we can infer what that means. Um, what are some of the military use cases? What are some of the other use cases uh, that, that you would see for uh, I The generic application from our perspective was just to image information rich areas. Like let's just take uh, the city of Manhattan, for example. If I could provide a high resolution map of all of Manhattan every half hour, so it's not a live video, but it's a, a map as high quality as anything you've seen in Google Earth, but it's current to within 30 minutes. Um, there, you could then use software to mine that data and extract information that's important to business, public service, traffic control, uh, emergency responders, weather information. And so I could have potentially thousands of subscribers for a fixed database. And that was one of the interests that I had initially. So like the, the, literally the, 
let me get this one. The business model is I'm going to fly a drone around Manhattan. A team. A, a team of them, not just one, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to fly a team of drones around Manhattan, and then I'm going to uh, try to see how I can monetize the information. If, if there were already uh, identified areas, uh, just with the traffic monitoring, or um, so just to back up a little, these drones would not only do aerial imaging in terms of static images, but each of them would have a stabilized uh, camera system to do live video. So any drone could be uh, access for law enforcement to be used in place of a, a helicopter. So if there's a law enforcement issue or fire or some type of disaster, that the drone could then be used to give the airborne information that they needed. So you could basically have a contract then with the police and fire departments to supplement anything that they would normally do. So anything you want to see from the air over these cities, I wanted the, the drones to be doing because, you know, there's only a limited number of helicopters, they're noisy, people don't like them flying around, they're expensive. This was like a, a, a perfect match. And the, and the kind of data you can get from even small drones, especially at the lower altitudes, is entirely competitive with the, these larger manned helicopters. Am, am I sort of hearing your, your grammar? You, you seem to be suggesting that this was a dream you once had, but it, it, it went the way of the total. I mean, is, is this, have you given up on this dream of, uh, of mowing, uh, <laughs> <laughs> mowing, mowing with images? Yeah, mowing, yeah. mowing with images? Um, no, uh, but in the United States, it's it's greatly delayed by the recent uh, last uh, six years. The laws have changed dramatically, and not so much on the privacy issue, but on the issue of operating an unmanned aircraft that could potentially collide with a manned airplane and cause injury or harm. So the FAA made rules that made it almost impossible to fly these things in a viable business setting. Now, we, you'll hear stories in the news about drones being flown over the border, but it's normally one or two predators, and it's operated by a zillion people, and costs a lot of money, and all kinds of airspace uh, coordination is going on. There aren't people just launching small airplanes and looking around, legally at least. Um, and that's because the FAA said, you can't do that. We, we don't want anything flying beyond visual range of the operator. So it means that uh, if this thing's flying, I have to be able to see it, which is essentially like a model airplane. So why did I bother putting in an autopilot with GPS and all this fancy stuff to make it autonomous when I really have to just sit there and, and do this kind of thing? And then I can't cover enough uh, mileage to, to, to have a real business based on that. All right, so I, I, do, have a, I do have a question for you. See, in talking to you, you, you seem like a very reasonable person, Steve, to me. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I just wonder, sort of, why is it that your URL, when you go online, is spyplanes.com? <laughs> you, you want to talk a little bit of life with that URL? Yeah. You, yeah. In, in the modern era, that seems like a little bit of an edgy uh, website name. <laughs> yeah. I got that domain name in 1998. And that, you know, height of the internet boom. Everybody was trying to come up with a name to distinguish themselves. And um, because my company was actually started in 1987, and I, the internet really didn't exist, and I was foolish enough to choose the name MLB, which was the initials of the three of us that started it. Unfortunately, that's also Major League Baseball. And you're not going to get a website named MLB.com. So it would be an uphill battle. So at the time, it's fine. You know, we're using the word drone here in UAV, uh, and everybody seems to know what that is. But back in uh, the time when I was getting this uh, domain name, drone didn't even mean anything to anyone. But spy plane, at least, you know, they could conceptualize what that was. And we were building miniature spy planes. We weren't using them to spy on anyone. We were using them to gather information. But um, that's where it all came from. They, they didn't have reasonableplane.com. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so um, I, I want to come back a little bit to this question of, of use cases. Uh, as I understand, you actually have some footage with you that you're taking from me. Um, maybe, uh, but maybe before we, we do that, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit with um, Catherine about, about this. Um, so, Catherine, you obviously have some, some doubts around the use of this technology. Um, and, you know, I, I read your report. I mean, it's really wonderful. I recommend it to everyone to read this report about the domestic use of drones. What was great about it was that you actually mapped out the technology, you explained what it's capable of, and the variety in that, um, and then the law, et cetera. I, I wonder if you could sort of talk us through some of the concerns. What motivated you to write this report, and what are some of its key conclusions? Sure. Um, so I think it's worth starting out by saying the ACLU is not opposed to the use of drones. 
we think there are a lot of really valuable uses of potentially uh, doing search and rescue missions, uh, so being involved in tactical operations by law enforcement. But we do have some concerns, and those concerns have to do primarily with privacy. Um, as with any new technology, there are good and bad uses, and we want to make sure that as drones are adopted, they don't become a tool for widespread surveillance. Um, so far, as um, has been mentioned, the Federal Aviation Administration has um, largely held up the domestic deployment of drones. Um, but drones are becoming um, cheaper and more powerful um, pretty consistently. Local police departments um, are quite interested in acquiring them. There are many police departments that could never afford to purchase a helicopter, but could potentially afford to purchase a drone. And in this country, we don't have great privacy protections in place. Um, to ensure that as drones are used, they're, they're used in a way that takes advantage of the beneficial uses while um, not uh, subjecting Americans to an invasion of privacy. Um, so I think those are the broad contours of our concerns. Um, you know, we have a few different privacy concerns. Um, it, I think it's worth talking, talking about the fact that it's not just about the drone, it's about the camera. Um, Drones can be equipped with quite powerful cameras. They can be equipped with cameras that can zoom in um, far more than you could ever see with the naked eye. They can be equipped with thermal imaging cameras that can see in the dark. Um, there's technology being developed that could potentially um, see through walls and other surfaces. Um, and when you talk about using these potentially powerful technologies of surveillance, um, we want to make sure that they're used in a way um, that's responsible. That is to say, they're only used where law enforcement has a good reason to believe they would turn up evidence of wrongdoing, and that they're not just used for more pervasive surveillance. So, what's the difference between a drone flying around, like, like Steve described, um, and just having a camera on a street corner? Right? We already have in Chicago, New York, all, all these places have uh, uh, cameras. Uh, that are on all the time. Um, are, you, are you really more or less concerned about that technology? I think some of the concerns with drones are similar to the concerns with other types of cameras. Um, and some of them are different. Um, but I think even, even the pervasive use of cameras on the streets poses privacy concerns. Um, it's clear, for instance, that when people know that they're being observed, they modify their behavior. Um, and, and I think that has that can have a chilling effect on people's um, ability, for instance, to engage in First Amendment expressive activity. Um, cameras uh, in all sorts of settings um, often fall fall victim to problems with lawyers and people being observed for illegitimate reasons. There was a case, for instance, in New York in 2004, I, I believe, um, where an NYPD helicopter uh, took about four minutes four minutes of footage of two adults who were on a dark balcony thinking. They were in private, uh, and and yet they were in fact actually being filled by an NYPD helicopter. Um, so I think those concerns are common with all cameras. But I think drones also pose some unique concerns in addition. Um, you know, they can potentially be used to track individuals. The Supreme Court just decided a big case recently having to do with location tracking. Um, and drones, while they're primarily, uh, we're primarily talking about surveillance, can also, um, as we know from the wars overseas, be used to intervene with conflicts on the ground. Um, so for instance, Houston, or I, I don't think it was Houston, but it was a law enforcement agency in the Houston suburbs, recently acquired a drone um, that's capable, for instance, of using tasers or shooting bean bags. Um, and actually being- That's amazing. Yeah, that's right. And although the, the law enforcement agency says that they have no current plans to use that type of technology, I think one of the things we with, with all sorts of surveillance technologies, a tendency towards mission creep. Um, a law enforcement agency acquires a drone, for instance, uh, you know, for one totally benign purpose. We'll only focus this on, on um, you know, on people engaged in wrongdoing, and then of course it has these additional capabilities, um, which are used more in the future. Um, I also think we don't necessarily all agree about what the appropriate scope of surveillance is. Um, Ogden, Utah, was another interesting example. Um, Ogden wants to acquire a surveillance blimp. And uh, when their police chief was asked about this, he was quoted in the papers essentially saying, well, I think if this blimp, people know that this blimp is up in the air and they could be observed, people will simply behave better. 
Yeah. 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 Um, guidelines that we think law enforcement agencies should follow before um, before they adopt the powerful technology. So, okay, so let's drill, let's drill down a little bit um, on this question of, of whether the law restricts the, the use of drugs. Um, you don't have any glimpse, do you, Steve? You have no fear. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, one, one difference uh, you could imagine as between um, as between a camera and a that's just stationary on the street uh, and a drone uh, might be the fact that that not only does the camera on the street that, that, that the camera on the street looks at a public space where you ostensibly have no reasonable expectation of privacy because you're on the public street. Although you know we can talk a little bit about how complicated that is. Um, whereas a drone permits you to see things from a public vantage. So in other words, you might be able to see someone's backyard. Or you might be able to see someone's. Um, you even inside of the structures as we had in the, in the case involving marijuana being grown in a, in a, uh, in a greenhouse that was visible through the, the hole. Um, does, that, does that distinction bother you? I mean, is it, are you concerned that just sort of more is visible from uh, a drone than, than, than an ordinary camera? Do you think that, that matters? Yeah. I do think that matters. Although, well, I'm concerned about, about about innocent Americans being surveilled in public generally, whether it's in a public place or whether um, whether it's it's you know in a private space such as someone's backyard, um, I just think people who, who who aren't doing anything wrong shouldn't have to fear that they're being observed. And to the extent drones expands the you know, the number of spaces in which people are potentially vulnerable, I do think. Do you agree with me that um, that if people were like doing cocaine by the pool? Uh, that a drone could just fly over and see that and that would not be constitutional. Do I agree with that with that Yeah. You know, I don't think the answer to that question is clear. Um, that's what you're saying, that's what I'm getting at. No, not, neither am I. But so yeah, so can you talk through that a little bit? So drone flies over a cocaine party at a pool. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's worth remembering that in the 1980s, the Supreme Court decided a series of cases dealing with um, dealing with the use of manned aircraft for surveillance. And you know, those cases essentially proved the various types of surveillance that went on um, and said that you don't need a warrant based on probable cause, for instance, to fly over someone's backyard because anyone who was in the airspace could potentially see what's going on there. Um, you know, the drones are substantially more powerful because they're not subject to the same, um, some of the same restrictions. Um, by which I mean, you know, it's for example, financially prohibitive for a police department to acquire a helicopter, right? But that natural limit will fall away as drones become cheaper and more important. And so you might ask why this is relevant. But I think um, the Supreme Court's decision last week in Jones helps answer some of that question. Um, I think the analogy is that in the 1980s, the Supreme Court likewise agreed um, that it was a constitutional problem to attach a primitive tracking device called a beeper to um, to a barrel that was in someone's car and the traffic movement on a public street. Um, but the Supreme Court was recently very concerned about the use of GPS technology to, to engage in tracking in public places. And I think they were concerned in part because um, this technology is cheap and easy and you could sit in your you know, police precinct station and simply watch um, someone move around town on your laptop. And I think the court is potentially prepared to say um, that when when some of the natural limits on surveillance fall away, um, that legal limits need to step up in its place. And that's why I think your full party has those potential to So what was interesting about the, uh, to me about the Jones case, although I, I think it depends a little bit on how you slice it, um, obviously the majority opinion attached a great deal of significance to the fact that the, the, the cops physically attached the CBS device to the car. Um, Steve, let me ask you this actually. So, the drone, the drones that you have worked with, that given the state of technology right now, could you task a drone, assuming that uh, no limit by the FAA, um, could you task a drone with follow this person, follow this car, or is that just wildly beyond the capability of 
Well, that's, that's being done. Um, I have some video showing a little bit of an example of that. Um, if you want to show now or whatever. Actually, I didn't really look at it yet. I would like to show that. Um, so it's an example of a drone following a specific target. Uh, let me just, uh, could you do something that says tracker on it, tracker video? Click on that one. Yeah, that one. That one's good. So this is, uh, there's many sort of standard functions. This is, um, well, in this well-lit room, it's going to look really well. It's probably a little hard to see. Can we, can we turn that down the light maybe a little bit? Uh, maybe just these ones right here. I haven't seen this footage yet. Either. So what this is, is uh, it's a small, you know, 35-pound aircraft uh, circling a few thousand feet away. And uh, with a you know, 26 to 1 zoom lens on the camera and a stabilized camera system, and using uh, software, it's holding lock on a fixed target. You know, you can see people walking around. This was filmed through a low cloud layer. So the drone was actually not even visible or audible from the ground. But this is what I want to show you. So now we, we've designated that truck as a target, and the camera stays locked onto it, hands off. The aircraft can also be allowed to follow it. In this case, the aircraft stayed in its orbit, so the car is getting further and further away. But these are built-in features on the systems we sell already. Um, you know, it's, it's, I don't envision commercial users wanting to do this. This is mainly for our military customers, which is 90% of our business now, because that's all we can sell to. But these are uh, sort of standard features. Huh. Well, I, I, that actually shocked me. I didn't realize, I thought this was like some future thing. I mean, I, I'm like, <laughs> I'm an early adopter, but this is even surprising me. Well, um, yeah. Yeah, so this is based on visual um, tracking. So if, if this car goes through a tunnel, it's, uh, it it's, you know, stays there long enough that the filtering algorithms and the drone can't estimate where it is, you'll lose it. It's, it doesn't have a GPS beaver on the car. So this is, this is, what, uh, this is uh, what we call tracking an uncooperative target. And, and of course, you know, most of these things are going to sound onerous because this is targeted towards the military that wants to invade the privacy and not and deal with non-cooperative targets. So right. you're going to see you know, a bunch of stuff here that's like, yeah, we can really reach out and see things here. Wow, OK, so um, let me ask another hypothetical then, because I'm so encouraged by this one that I'm going to go with pushing in front of it. Could, um, could the paparazzi uh, in LA Get a drone, oh absolutely, and give it like a picture of uh, of uh, Brad Pitt, and just be like, when you fly around, when you see this guy, take a bunch of follow him around. Is that conceivable, or is that it's still wildly un unlikely? Oh, it's, it's definitely conceivable, but um, the, the the challenges there are, you know, facial recognition, even with a close up camera and a good frontal view, is still kind of its infancy for you know real time uh, identification of a face in a crowd, but. Uh, the drones are a little bit disadvantaged because when you're looking at people from above, you don't, a human being from above doesn't give you as many pixels to look at. And um, I can just show another. Example. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have the PowerPoint? Yes. <coughs> um, just scroll down a couple of slides until we uh, uh, we'll come back to these if we need to. But go, go to <coughs> Keep going. This is an example of imagery from one of our aircraft. Yeah, go keep working. Uh, so here, I've got it right here. If you stop, uh, you can see in this image. This is this is in full resolution of a single frame. Now the single frame is much bigger than was taken by the airplane. The airplane took thousands of these images, all overlapping, that were stitched into a map of an entire city. We did it all in one hour. But in this single frame, I don't know if you can see under the under my laser pointer, but there's a person near that bulldozer. You can see their point. The shadows tend to be more visible because they're projected depending on sun angle. There's a lot more contrast. So you can see people, vehicles. You can almost see what's in the back of the beds of these pickup trucks. This is all, the, the, the reason I put this video here is not because I'm interested in the people and what's in the back of these trucks. This is an example of construction going on in this town. And if you're a contractor and saw this in the updated map, you'd want to target this area for possible uh, business opportunity. Um, not that you want to invade those people's privacies. This is untargeted surveillance. They just happen to be in the image doing those things at that time. But that image was taken with a $900 SLR camera mounted in the nose of an autonomously flying aircraft. And uh, so that's that's what you can see without much effort these days. Okay, so it's amazing. So, um, Catherine, I want to come back to you for a moment on this. So, 
Yeah, I had a, a, a mutual friend of ours, I won't, I won't name him, had a, co had a conversation with uh, the Federal Aviation Administration in which he sort of pushed on this privacy angle. And he was like, you know, you guys are, are thinking about, because actually, I don't know if people, this is widely known, but the Federal Aviation Administration has been making noises like they're going to relax some of these restrictions that seems blocking it. Right? So there's, there's a lot of pressure um, from the right of quarters on the FAA to rethink this because people think that technology is so potentially useful, folks are trying to sell it, uh, and so there might be sort of a reinvestigation. So you know, in light of that, um, someone we know called them up and said, you know, well, aren't you guys worried about the uh, about the privacy ramifications? And the response, again, this is, you know, sort of from third or fourth hand, um, was, we're about safety, right? I mean, we view safety, like that's what we, we're concerned about. We want to make sure that it can sense and avoid, and otherwise we're going to make you limit it to, to, to where it is. Um, I don't know if they shrugged when they said it, but um, <laughs> yeah, they're like, come on. So, I mean, my question for Catherine is, who, who, should, who should be the, who, if anyone, should be placing limits here? Is it, is it really just that it has to come to the level of, of someone having, having to challenge their conviction? Um, or do we really leave it up to individual, you know, uh, 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 sheriffs, you know, sheriffs to do this? I mean, so who should be the one setting the kinds of uh, limits that you're talking about? Well, the way it works right now is pretty much every, um, you know, if it, if it weren't for the FAA's restriction, pretty much every police department would decide on their own. Um, you know, there's a term for this we use at the ACLU. It's called policy by procurement, right? There's, um, what does that mean? Yeah, well, it, yeah it, it just means that policy isn't set through sort of an open and public debate, right? Um, it's just that vendors sell this technology to law enforcement agencies and they think it'll be useful and this stuff is purchased and the public doesn't necessarily even um, know that, that this technology exists or is being used until potentially years after, after the fact. Um, you know, drones are potentially one example of that, but it's, it's just a common phenomenon. So for instance, we know now that law enforcement agencies tracking the location of cell phones since at least the late 1990s, but you know the public wasn't aware of that until the mid-2000s. So you know, that's often how our privacy regulations are made in this country. Um, technology gets adopted, um, it's used for a long time, and then finally the public gets wind of it and expresses some concerns, and then perhaps some restrictions are put in place on the back end. Um, you know, I don't think that's such a fantastic or democratic way um, to decide important questions of privacy. Um, but unfortunately in this country, we don't have, for instance, what a lot of European countries have, which is sort of a, a, a federal level privacy commissioner <coughs> who, who exists to address questions like that. We have a more ad hoc decision making process. Um, and again, that's one of the reasons we issued our report was to at least start trying to come up with some guidelines that you know uh, local legislatures can use when they start adopting this technology and want to find a way to take advantage of its tremendous potential. Everyone acknowledges that it can do tremendous good while still making sure that people's privacy is invaded. What's been the response uh, to your report? I mean, I've seen it widely covered, but uh, what's been the response? To, have you gotten any feedback? <laughs> The, the, the report has received a fair amount of media attention. I, you know, I actually think it, we were fairly lucky. It came out just a few days after Iran started showing its footage of that drone that they captured, and sort of coincidentally that popped this issue up um, to a level that we didn't really anticipate at the time um, that we were issuing the report. Um, you know, in terms of What's that? I tweeted it. And you tweeted it. Oh, that's where it all comes from. <laughs> the Twitterverse. Yeah. Um, so, in, you know, in terms of more specific responses from local law enforcement agencies, for instance, we haven't really gotten any, but I think one of the reasons for that is because, as we've all been saying, um, you know, the FAA right now is largely holding back the domestic drones. So, actually, Steve, let me ask you this issue. Um, so, that's right. So, we have an example where, apparently, or ostensibly, Iran made us to ground a military drone. Prior to that, years ago, we had an instance where, um, uh, Insurgents' computers were found to have drone footage on them because they managed to tap into the video feed. I mean, how much is this security an issue? Like, even if it gets deployed responsibly by police, what if other people hack into it and thereby compromise privacy? I mean, have you thought much about security? Oh, yeah. And uh, to highlight this, can we go to uh, yeah. a slide for everybody? Man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the first slide. So how do we just refer to this? Because it's important to know that there, the drones come in different flavors. And hacking into a drone, the, the, the one in the upper left here, 
a five pound uh, quad or hexacopter, which is, you're gonna be seeing a lot of these. That's what the police are most likely gonna be buying if they're allowed to. Mm -hmm. And that's what amateurs and individuals are gonna be operating. They're gonna get all kinds of interesting footage that you'll see that accidentally invade people's privacy. So hacking into one of those, you know, if they can only fly for 30 minutes, maybe go a half mile away, it could be a nuisance, but it's not going to be a game changer. You hack into a global hawk down in the other corner of the slide, you know, a 36-hour airplane that can cover, can literally fly half the way around the world and still do a useful mission and is in complete satellite communication at all times. That is a big deal, but not as big a deal as hacking into the one called Predator B, which is right before the global hawk. The reason the Predator B is the one that I would be most afraid of is it's the one carrying the missiles. And uh, I guess that's mainly a military hacking question, not a privacy hacking question. But um, the whole weapons being fired from drones and the security of that, that is a whole other thing, which I'm sure you'll be getting into it in probably a different seminar. But, uh, so, but as you get into these more capable aircraft, you know, hacking into that, there, there's some safety issues you know, from airspace, from uh, doing harm to people. But then from the privacy thing, yeah, um, not only is it make possibly live private information be seen by people who shouldn't, but if it's being used by law enforcement, it can compromise their operations if, uh, just like people listen to police scanners and call up criminals and say, hey, they're coming to get you, it, it, you know, it affects their ability to operate. So um, the technology of hacking into these things, uh, there's all kinds of ways to encrypt communication and to make sure these things don't happen and to also program behaviors into the drone so that if they're not uh, properly controlled or, or lose link with their operator, that they have certain well-understood prescribed behaviors, those should all be uh, prescripted and required. But you know, because the FAA has basically said no to everything and there are no standards for how these things are operated and communicated with, uh, which also brings the FCC into play, so you've got many government organizations, it's, it's just it's the Wild West right now. Anything can happen. And uh, it's extremely embarrassing when the military loses control of one of their own airplanes and ends up in Iran, and they weren't even able to destroy the thing. I mean, to me, that's just almost inconceivable, but it, it, it already has happened. And I can understand it with maybe one of ours, but you know, one of ours little airplanes is, the whole idea behind our airplane is, is if the military loses one, who cares? Um, the technology is not so far out there that other countries don't already have it. And, the value of the airplane is worth, you know, sending someone out to go pick it up. Um, you should just, you know, you should not care one bit if you lose it in that case. You know, it's interesting. Oh, yeah. The mic's off? The mic's off. Oh, the light's off. Sure. Um, so, you know, interestingly, though, um, uh, you had mentioned the hexacopter is what is where folks might, you know, sort of buy. Um, that cute little innocuous hexacopter. Uh, you know, but, but there was that case where, um, a predator bee was used to catch those cattle rustlers in North Dakota, right? And so, you know, um, are, are we not, are either of you, uh, maybe I'll start with Catherine, worried about sort of drones getting accepted for one purpose and then being used for another? Essentially, once you got them, you know, and they're not, they're not, you know, I'm not using it right now, so I'll let you catch cattle rustlers, right? I mean, how much is that an issue? And can you even, could you possibly give any analogs to, to previous technology that's been Wow. Okay. Well, so I don't know how many of you know that story, uh, but there was a great story published by the LA Times in December. Um, and you know, it was amazing because even those of us, I think, who follow drones fairly closely were surprised by what was revealed in the story. And it was revealed for the first time that Customs and Border Protection was actually um, loaning out its drones to local law enforcement agencies to conduct operations. Um, and you know, I'm not sure I'm going to remember all of the facts correctly, but the gist is that some cattle had wandered on to uh, a particular ranch. Um, and they didn't necessarily belong to the people who lived there. Uh, the people who lived there were hostile towards law enforcement. And uh, so before the local law enforcement agents uh, entered the property, um, they called on CBP, and CBP flew its drones over the area and were able to tell the local law enforcement agencies exactly where um, where people were located on the property and also were able to tell law enforcement agencies whether those individuals were armed. Um, you know, that's not a particularly um, you know, offensive or objectionable use of the drones. In fact, you know, it's a valuable uh, assistance to law enforcement in that particular 
in that particular instance where they were executing a warrant for it that they'd gotten with probable cause. Um, but it did show that, um, that it really sort of opened up the possibilities in your mind, right, for what, for what these drugs could be used for. Um, and actually, some members of Congress expressed some level of dismay um, that, that drones which had been authorized for use of one purpose, border patrol, immigration, protecting um, against you know, the unlawful importation of drugs, were being used for this totally different purpose. Any thoughts on this? I mean, is it, you know, people probably come to you with a particular purpose in mind and use it. Yeah, and, but I don't see uh, the, the, the things that would upset someone, I don't see that so much on the commercial end. Um, I, I, the things I fear or are most concerned about come actually from misuse on the law enforcement end and on the military end. Uh, because they have a bit more motivation to do things like that. I mean, I, I guess maybe there might be a lot of money in invading people's privacy on the commercial end if it were legal. <laughs> But right now, there's more money in just doing things that are, are, are more acceptable on the commercial end. But yeah, I'm mostly concerned with, um, especially the weaponization, which I know isn't the focus here, but we see that kind of creep in the industry. The creep being that, okay, the Predator B's got missiles on it, everything needs to have missiles now. People are, I don't know if you know, there is an arms race going on around the world right now for drones. Everybody wants them. And it's not just because of the information that they gather, but you know, we've been blasting people off the face of the earth from uh, this invisible platform that, you know, it's like a bolt of lightning coming out of the sky in your village and people are vaporized. And it's so these, these assassinations, essentially, that there's been creep in what we would we, we do. We normally would only send a drone out to do a very high value targeted assassination with, you know, all sorts of government orders. But it's creeped now into, well, if Pakistan wants to get some guy and we need a favor for Pakistan, maybe we'll go take somebody out for them. And so, that is then going into all the smaller drones too, with smaller missiles and weapons. So that's a, that, you know that's interesting. I mean, obviously there is a whole other discussion. Apparently there is a panel about this next week um, uh, on international um, military use of drones. But there is an analog, right? I mean, there is a way in which these two conversations are similar, and it's that um, people are concerned that we're going to engage in more warfare if the costs are less to us in terms of, of treasury and blood. Um, so we'll. Go do a favor for Pakistan if we don't have to send in our own uh, our own troops to do it, but we can just send this because we know. Similarly, what uh, what Captain said uh, and what uh, you know uh, the concurrences all said in, in the Jones case was that um, the concern about some of these surveillance technologies is they just make it too easy to jail somebody, and so you just end up having more surveillance uh, uh, precisely because it's there's less of a obstruction to it. Um, so I don't know if so those things are completely off. Uh, um, all right, well, I, I definitely want to um, uh, open it up to, to your questions as well. Um, I just want to make sure, do you want to show anything else uh, that you have, or do you want to leave any other comments before I open it up for questions? I have videos showing the actual operation of these things, but I can hold those off until afterwards if you want to see you know, what it looks like to like, takes off, lands, that kind of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Okay, good. Anything else you want to add before we open it up? Um, so we have a couple of microphones. One of them's right there, and uh, one of them's right here. If, if you don't mind sort of queuing up and then alternating, uh, if you have any questions, that would be that would be really great. And, and uh, if you don't, I'll continue with my, with my line. Um, so yeah. Good to see you. Hi, I'm Eugene. Uh, I'll let you I have a question for Catherine. Um, so, uh, the chilling effect you mentioned, is I couldn't even think about, was the, I think there are two rival chilling effects. My wife is like, out in the street. Maybe she's going to decide to join us uh, unpopular religious group. And then she might be chilled from going into the White House because she knows that people are watching. That's a minus. But, you know, she also hopes that whoever wants to rob her or rape her or kidnap her or kids or whatever else will be chilled from doing that. That's a plus. So let's focus on what I some of the you guys do have a problem, which is a, or which is the probable causeless general surveillance. There are these chilling effects. Why should we be why should we be against it because of the negative chilling effect and not for it because of the positive? 
the chilling effect on street crime, which still remains even with the declines in crime over the last 20 years, a serious problem. You know, I think that's a really excellent question, and obviously we're all incredibly sympathetic to the idea that the use of pervasive video surveillance um, can potentially deter crime. Um, but I think it's ultimately a values question. Um, and, um, you know, we take the view that, um, you know, that, 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 the, that the freedom to be able to walk around without, uh, without necessarily being subjected to surveillance when you haven't done anything wrong wrong is a valuable thing. Um, you know, I think it sort of echoes in what the Supreme Court was talking about earlier this week. Um, although I actually like Justice Ginsburg's formulation for the DC Circuit the best. He talked about, you know, when you engage in surveillance of someone, um, you learn a great deal about them. You learn their daily routine, but not just what they do every Monday, but when they deviate from that. You learn, um, you know, potentially where someone goes to the doctor um, and you get this totality view of, of who someone is. Um, and, and and that chilling effect is, is pervasive. So you know, I'm certainly not meaning to discount um, you know, the impact of, of, of surveillance cameras on, on, on chilling inappropriate behavior. Uh, I think it's a hard issue. But you cast in terms of freedom, I'm very sympathetic with that. I think it's a serious freedom. But well, not, but in the sympathetic, I guess. Let's hypothesize that she might cast in terms of freedom too. She may say, I want the freedom to go around without being attacked. In fact, some people say, I may want the freedom to go to the mosque, let's say, without being attacked by somebody who doesn't like people who go to the mosque. So it's really a trade-off. It's not just between sort of freedom and security. It's a trade-off between freedom and freedom, right? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a good point. I think that's a good point. I will say, though, Eugene, that, that there, there have been a few studies that suggests that video surveillance actually does not reduce crime, mm -hmm. um, that it maybe displaces crime. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps a drone kind of nudges the crime all over the city, and you have to sort of follow it around. <laughs> <laughs> but, but equally, there's no, there, unfortunately, there's no good yeah. data showing that, uh, uh, there's no good data yeah. to support a capitalist position either. Like, that is to say, we don't have good data about the chilling effect. So uh, I would love to see sort of a pure vote of view, but I think it's much more Uh, I'm here in so I created this. It's going to seem like double dipping because I'm going to ask about Eugene Bollock's classic 2000 paper, uh, <laughs> Privacy uh, versus uh, Free Speech, and, and the troubling implications of the right to keep people from talking about you. So, really, to build on Eugene's question about freedom, what about the freedom to observe? So, I'm very sympathetic to your concerns about the Fourth Amendment and about government surveillance. Uh, I personally very much side with the uh, position that Cato took in the Jones case, which is that Katz was has really been misinterpreted. And the real issue is what uh, Justice Stewart said about how what we do in, in, in public, uh, even that can be protected if we strive to seek to keep it private. In other words, the standard should be about accessibility, and that's what you've been talking about here today. So on the Fourth Amendment, totally sympathetic to you. But when we're talking about the private use of these technologies, this to me seems to be very much like uh, two things. One is the, uh, the ongoing debate about the right of photography in public. So why don't I have a First Amendment right to, um, to photograph uh, people in the public, to photograph what goes on in the street? Why should I have to ask for permission uh, to do that? And, and why should we essentially give people a um, quasi-copy right in their visage or what they do out in public to, such that they would have to be able to stop me from, from photographing them, whether it's on the street with my camera or with the same camera that I put on one of these things and fly up in the sky. And so the second thing this reminds me of uh, is um, in, you know, we live in a transparent world because President Eisenhower succeeded in the 1950s, uh, basically into, um, in a sense, uh, maneuvering the Soviets to be going first. They had taken the position that, uh, that, the, that satellites uh, would not have the right of uh, overflight. And they would be treated just like planes, and that territorial limits went all the way up uh, into the universe forever. And that would have stopped satellite photography. And to make a long story short, uh, he got basically, he said either the U.S. is going to go first with the civilian program or the Russians will go first. And in either event, they will have to abandon their position. And we got from that the right of not only peaceful use of space, but peaceful overflight and of photography from space. And, and that's very similar to me, to aerial photography. And it's a way of saying really that you know, we, we are living in a more transparent society than David Britain put it. And that really is about the first minute. So to bring this all together, Private sector, I do it. You, you know, a company does it. That's going to grow. Maybe it's not the main issue today. Why should we stop that? And how should we 
uh, deal with that trade-off of values, and how should we um, maybe deal with privacy concerns in a way that uh, restricts government without restricting free speech rights? So, um, yeah, I, I should certainly be clear that the ACLU supports the right of individuals to take pictures in public. Um, so, for instance, we represent an individual uh, who's lost in his book, who's facing up to the first circuit. Uh, he uh, was uh, walking down the street and saw the police arresting someone and uh, took video footage of that, uh, which the police officers did not like one bit and was ultimately prosecuted for that, although the prosecution was dismissed. And, um, you know, we, we fully supported his right to take footage in public. And so there's no, um, you know, there's no question that photography, videotaping the police can um, be a really useful way to achieve accountability goals. Um, I think we've all seen a lot of footage from the Occupy movements, for example. Um, including drone footage, actually. Right? Including yeah. drone footage. Um, but I'm thinking particularly of some of the pepper spraying incidents. Um, you know, which has been really, really useful in shaping the public debate on what has happened in Occupy. And I know from my own experience, I, you know, among the issues I work on, um, I'm currently litigating an excessive use of force case where FBI agents ended up kicking, punching, and pepper spraying a collection of journalists. Um, and the video footage of that happening, because you kicked, punched, and pepper spray journalists, there's going to be some footage of that. Um, you know, it, it's actually, I think, really valuable to our case because you can help overcome, for instance, a jury's natural um, predisposition to assume the good faith of the law enforcement officers and discount people on the other side. So, you know, I, I think these issues are difficult, and we certainly support the ability of private individuals to be able to take this footage. Um, you know, I think you can consistently, with that, uh, believe there should be restrictions on the government's ability um, to, to use the same technology because the government doesn't, you know, have First Amendment rights that individuals do. But I recognize that, you know, it certainly gets complicated in the margin. There, but I mean, um, you know, surely there have to be limits even on that, right? Um, are not the same concerns at play in terms of people not feeling comfortable uh, doing what they would otherwise do because the corporation is watching them as opposed to the government? What, what, I mean, what, 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 what was the doctrinal basis for, for thinking that that should? Well, we're, 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 not, we're talking, we're, I think we're talking in the realm of public policy, not doctrine, right? I mean, your question seems to be about um, freedoms, uh, not essentially a doctrinal question. So I guess what I'm asking you is that why do you draw a distinction from whence does it divide? between the harm caused by government surveillance, which it seems they've committed to, and the harm caused by excessive corporate surveillance. Because the Fourth Amendment limits government's power to surveil us, so and the First Amendment protects our rights to, to observe things in public and communicate about them. And that's a principle, clear doctrinal distinction, at least in principle. So, so do you think that basically just see Constitution? Well, well, no, I, really, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm really asking about Eugene's paper and, and his point. I mean, I, I, I don't want to speak for him because he's actually here, but his point in the paper is that, that there are trouble. Where's Marshall McLuhan? Is he here? Uh, as the title of his paper suggests, of, of starting to go down that road and, and dismissing. But, but this conversation has gone on now in Washington about facial recognition. And, and the First Amendment concerns have not been addressed. And, and there are troubling implications for um, just saying that, well, maybe we want to allow individuals to do this, we don't want government to do it, and then we're not going to talk about what happens with companies. Um, and, and we're just saying that conversation needs to happen, and it is a conversation about trade-offs. And I think that's Eugene's point. So I'll leave it at that. I want to thank the uh, Law Review for hosting this discussion. Uh, and really, to echo what Ryan said, put in a plug for everybody to attend the talk on Monday um, by UN Special Rapporteur <coughs> Richard Falk about the legality of drone warfare in places like Somalia and Yemen and Pakistan, where there is no declared war. But my question here is, um, is actually for Stephen. Um, so you made this distinction, I think, between the commercial uses of drones versus law enforcement and military. But I think to many in the room, I think the commercial potential uses of drones are some of the most frightening. I mean, if you think about the potential drones, so for example, for um, you know Viagra or an erectile dysfunction disease to go into a bedroom and say, should I mark it to this demographic? Or if you're thinking about potentially <laughs> using it for a kid, you know, what kind of toy does he or she play with? I mean, so my question directly to you is, you kind of talk about drones, you know, as a manufacturer fit, like you have no, I mean, like it's a tool and that you have no 
that considerations of how they're used are really separate from, you know, kind of the questions surrounding their manufacturing. So I, I'm wondering to what extent in your operation, you're generally considering your roles in manufacture, do these questions of the potential uses and misuses of drones commercially guide um, kind of your considerations how you build this tool? Um, well, let me, uh, well, <laughs> can I go to the second slide here just so, I can, so people can see what I imagine the commercial uses of drones are? Just so, uh, this is uh, the third slide, I think. Uh, this is just, now when people normally show one of these lists, this can go into the hundreds of, of categories. I just tried to hit a, a bunch of the, the top notch ones. And this is tempered by capabilities of current technology. So the idea of like getting into people's rooms or seeing very keen details about personal interactions are still beyond the scope of most of the vehicles that I deal with. And I see most of the commercial applications really being in this larger surveillance types of uh, scenarios. Uh, and a lot of things that have a real strong humanitarian resonance, like uh, the disaster relief. One of the, one of the things that we want to do with these was, you've seen all the disasters around the world recently. First responders, when they get there, really have no idea what's going on. You'd be surprised at how little information they have. If in their response kit they had a drone that went out and mapped the whole area as soon as they arrived, it would save lives and be so much more effective at responding to disasters. But anyway, you can, you can see here from all kinds of things that are sort of either innocuous or very beneficial to society. And this is more where I come from on it. Now, I can't always anticipate what other people will do. And, um, uh, so as a manufacturer, if it were legal to operate these things commercially, we would, you know, we would seek some type of regulation from higher authorities on what we could and couldn't do. But what you're probably going to see in a lot of the initial commercial applications, if it does become legal, is that the, the people in the drone industry will actually be the operators in many cases. Uh, they will be the ones setting up surveillance uh, lease operations. And this happened with the military too. One of the most widely used drones, the Scan Eagle, uh, which is now owned by Boeing, uh, they leased that to the military. Most of the Scan Eagles were operated by Boeing personnel, and they have over 500,000 combat flight hours on Scan Eagle. And I think that only a small fraction of those are actually operated by military personnel. So you'd see the same thing on the commercial side. Um, we, you're going to see a lot of either unintentional, perhaps intentional invasion of privacy. I think it's going to really be on the amateur use of drones like with the Occupy movements and all. So what's going on there, you might, you might wonder, how did this person at this Occupy movement uh, legally fly this airplane and get away with it? The FAA didn't just throw them in the jail. If you're operating essentially like a model airplane, and you're doing it not for profit, and it's not a commercial vehicle, you can still, within the loosely defined model airplane guidelines, fly your little camera-carrying uh, aircraft. So you're going to see a lot of amateur operators out there just flying this thing to get a YouTube video or to get some kind of a sensational video. And I think they're going to be feeding a lot of the information that comes into question in the near term. Many of you probably saw the recent uh, story with the river of blood from the meatpacking plant. Does that ring a bell for anyone? Did you see that? Uh, okay, so, so some guy was flying his little camera carrying airplane around and saw this you know, stream filled with blood coming out of this meat processing facility. He alerted the authorities, and then they went in and did an investigation, did their own overflights with manned aircraft, and now charges are being filed. And I, I don't know how that falls on the legal spectrum, but that's a classic example we're going to be seeing more of, is an amateur enthusiast sees something and then alerts everyone else. Because they're going to multiply greater numbers than the commercial guys in the near term, because our hands are tied by the FAA. Just <laughs> follow up. I mean, just, my concern is more the way that social networking sites and these other sites have been used for data mining purposes, and what are the potential implications? And this is how you might see the use of it, but you know, there's all these uses of our division. To what extent, in your concern, and how you think about building this technology, do you really take into account these other kinds of concerns? So, if I can just ask you to follow. Um, uh, you know, we're trying to get the best data out there, and uh, so I guess that uh, initially I can't say that I am taking into concern whether um, that is harmful or helpful to a specific individual's privacy. Um, you know, if you look at my business cards, my company motto is airborne access to information. So I'm trying to get the information uh, into people's hands through technology, and I'm still, once again, just hoping the guidelines from the regulate, regulatory authorities will, will help to protect society from what might happen with that. So yeah, nothing on the technological end. 
I think it's limited enough, though, in many of these instances. Uh, there, there's certain scary things you can do with it, but then there's certain things that are just really hard to do. The flying in the window or watching what people do in their homes, that's still a bit out there. I'm a prospective uh, applicant, so I don't know if I'm on the right track here in terms of the doctrines, but I'm curious. Given that the FAA could modify its rules, what might be the prospects for legislation to prohibit private use of drones to overfly private property or tracking individuals without consent? Would there be a need to restrict overflight for private parties to human powered air, uh, human piloted aircraft? Could one make a case for a violation of property rights due to trespass by an inanimate object uh, that's controlled by someone else? So I can at least tackle the first question of that. Um, I don't think the prospects for congressional legislation are all that great. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, they're pending, pending legislation right now um, to, to try to compel the FAA to act more quickly to approve the use of drones. So it seems, um, it seems unlikely there would be corresponding privacy legislation. Uh, do you have thoughts on any other questions? Uh, you have yeah. yeah uh, I have another hat where I'm a helicopter pilot. And I fly around and buzz around all day long without any restriction. I do have to look at it not usually. Uh, as long as I'm flying high enough not to be a risk and a person to property. The, the difference would be the common law basis for uh, trespass uh, for individuals who are going from one point to another, but that's that's for natural persons. There's no common law basis for trespassing private property by inanimate devices that are the property of some other private party. No, uh, sure. I mean, the, the rules would be exactly the same. Yeah, they'd be exactly the same. I mean, I, you could imagine sort of weird cases where the the drone is flying so low that we wanted to say it was actually different, right? Because there's like, you know, the, 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 the drone is like hovering over your pool, like right there. You know, maybe, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so maybe it was sort of, but that's an interesting question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Pat. Oh, I'm oh, oh, sorry, you have two minutes for this. Actually, a question on a similar theme, more or less a follow-up. From the constitutional perspective, to the extent that Jones seemed to turn on this question of common law trespass and technical trespass, how do we see that applying in the drone context? Do we think that the court is likely to have to develop a law of trespass for drones? Obviously, they can't look to any 1791 common law analog for drone trespass. You, you, you wait. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I really don't know the answer to your question. Before the Supreme Court's decision last week, I had thought this whole trespass-based theory of the Fourth Amendment was dead, and none of us had been litigating under it for 40 years. Um, so, you know, it's a potentially exciting new avenue for Fourth Amendment challenges, but it's so new. I'm not really, I'm not really sure where where it will. Where it will go, uh, you know. I mean, after Katz versus United States, I thought we were all we all thought I think we were grounded in this reasonable expectation of privacy test, and this whole doc previous doctrine of physical invasion was 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 not one that was going to be carrying a lot of weight. Um, but but it, it, you know, five justices say otherwise, so we'll have to make new arguments based on that. I try to give people the biggest briefs to use drones as the example. Of this. So, so I think the case would have come out differently if it was drones, but. I have no good basis for that. <laughs> okay. uh, Peter Swire, Ohio State University, and Future Privacy Party. I want to go back to Ryan's cooking party, or at least your friends. And uh, thinking about a Fourth Amendment approach where if it turned out that the drones were targeting certain ethnic groups or certain people the police had a vendetta against, if at some point uh, we might think it was unreasonable because of the way these somewhat public seem to me or things are being done. There's a line of Fourth Amendment cases about sobriety checkpoints. So if, if the cops are allowed to stop cars, um, but it turns out they can't stop just the red cars, or just the cars from like the cute young women or something like that. They have to have procedures in place because it's unreasonable unless there's a structure of standards about how they stop the cars. And we also have minimization procedures in the Fourth Amendment. So there's limits when we just want to do a lot of surveillance and to, of how much we're allowed to, to go beyond the reason for the search. So I, I'm wondering, um, you know, perhaps for drones, if they're targeting certain groups for political, ethnic, other sorts of ways, if that might turn out to be, even though it's in public, even though it's your cocaine party, 
if it's always people just like you who are being targeted, that that's a sort of standardless discretion of describing checkpoints and this unfortunate What if we're just sort of flying around the neighborhood and just looking for anything at all? I mean, is that, so there's no check on that. Well, so there's a question of whether even then you'd want to have some standards in place that would be unreasonable for certain kinds of intrusive yeah. searches to be happening Under without any limits, because yeah. that's, anyway. You know, that, that's, that's sort of a different question based from, from what the court seems to have done more recently. Um, I mean, I guess we have this pending pending Supreme Court case, right, which deals with um, the, 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 the individual approach to vice president and, um, and touched him, right, and then lied about the fact that he had done so and then got um, arrested. And so the question is whether or not, you know, if you have a valid arrest, whether or not you can still have a person claim, um, you know, and so, I don't know, the role which an invalid purpose can play a role in But there's a general reason, yeah. apart from whether there's a, a, a warrant, there's a general reason that's required. And, it's, and, it, and I think that the, the Supreme Court justices' concerns about their own cars being watched. And how do you answer back why it's not okay to put surveillance on justice or whoever's car? Um, Part of the answer there is, it just seems outside of standards, it just starts to seem like such a general standard sort of thing that we need some way to, to have it back. And they couldn't really, I mean, they had the excuse of the physical touch in, in, uh, in Jones. But, but these, these variety checkpoint cases are still good law, and it's the lack of any standards that made it unconstitutional. But Peter, what's your, what's your sense of, of how much the cars are different um, I mean, it's doing any work there? You know, so we, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, well, but, but we, we also have it for minimization wiretaps. That's another place where there has to be, if, if they just sort of put a wiretap on somebody and it goes and goes and goes without limit. In Berger and other cases, they said that's just outside. You need to have standards to have it. And, and so we have, we, we have some, some general Fourth Amendment things to say we need to have some limits on just them doing it normally. Time for a couple more questions. Yeah. My name is Nusrat Khalidi, and my question is um, really why the FAA thought they need to ban sort of all commercial use. Um, could they have done something lesser, like um, put height restrictions maybe for safety reasons rather than just say, you know, commercial flight from? Uh, I, I perhaps exaggerated uh, the data impression that they were banned. They, they aren't technically banned. There is a process to get a certificate of authorization to fly in the national airspace. But it is a difficult, lengthy process, and it only allows you to operate in that visual range uh, so that the, the argument there is that it has killed the commercial market because of the, when you finally get the authorization, it is so limiting that there is hardly a business application that would benefit from that authorization. Unless you get a blanket authorization for the police force to use it, then the police would want it and I could sell to them. That becomes then a commercial uh, application. But uh, it, it is an outright ban, and it, and it stems from the uh, inability of an unmanned aircraft to sense and avoid other aircraft. And some people uh, still think that, oh, well, that only applies in crowded areas where there's a lot of airspace activity. But in fact, the example that's most often brought up of these worst case scenarios would be uh, you're out in the desert flying 10 feet off the ground with your unmanned airplane, and there's a hot air balloon with people in it. And a hot air balloon always has right away because it's a lighter than air aircraft. All other aircraft have to yield to it. And it's 10 feet off the ground. And you're in the middle of nowhere. And my airplane, you know, when I you know, inadvertently hit this, so the propane tanks explode and people die. It's a disaster. It's like the Hindenburg on a small scale. And um, that's, you know, that's what the FAA is. They don't want that. But there's a cultural and social phenomenon here, too, that even though people will tolerate, you know, a certain number of deaths due to poor judgment in flying aircraft or you know, aircraft that hit each other, all these things that happen that already claim lives in aviation, there is a perception that we are not ready for an unmanned aircraft causing something like that, even if the risk levels are so low that it's like one per hundred million or so, some almost down to zero. That's still considered unacceptable risk right now in the minds of the FAA. They need something 
that can perform the sense and avoid function at least as well as a human, and they haven't even quantified that. They're understaffed, underfunded, and the bottom line is the easiest thing for them to do is put up really high hurdles so that very few people end up operating these things and that therefore uh, everyone is still safe. And that's leading into other countries because if another country says, look, we're going to let drones do whatever they want, then um, airlines like United Airlines might say, look, I don't want to fly into your country if you've got robotic airplanes zipping all over the place and our airliner might hit one. So on, on that, you know, the legal implications of how they're operated are a whole other thing. But they do have drones flying in they, the rules vary, and yes, there are drones that the, 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 uh, there are countries where the rules are much more liberal. We did an, uh, an operation down in Mexico in 2005, and we went to Mexico to do it because we couldn't do it in the U.S., but we mapped uh, several hundred square miles using an, an unmanned, autonomously flying unmanned aircraft that flew out of communication range regularly. But we had permission from the government to fly below 1,000 feet to do that in those areas because they were uh, low air traffic and unpopular. So I know everyone's eager to check out the drone if they haven't, but I want to let uh, one, more, one more question here, and then uh, we'll go get a drink. We'll have cocaine for it. <laughs> it sounds like legally, uh, as a citizen, I have no protection against other people in the public square, i.e. The, the Constitution. I don't happen to like the concept that the public square is the uh, naked square. So maybe we need to change the constitutional law. The other option is to use the anonymous viewpoint and use the drones to surveil Scalia et al. <laughs> if, they, if we don't have protection and we want it, is the way to do it to show the people making the laws and the judgments that something's going to happen that they don't want. Yeah, so I mean, you know, what's interesting about about that is, um, um, is that that's been that's been the history uh, by and large. I mean, not not exclusively, uh, but, but by and large of, of privacy law in the United States. And one really good example of that is the Video Privacy Protection Act, which although it's being weakened to some extent today, was largely a product of the fact that a judicial nominee. Uh, uh, that their that their video records were, were found by out by uh, by some journalists and public. It was sort of outrageous to to the um, uh, to, to the Congress, uh, to lawmakers. Um, you know, I, I wonder a little bit, and I, I've argued this that that I think that drones are going to be su sufficiently disturbing to folks um, that they'll no longer tolerate the notion that there's no privacy in public because they won't feel okay in a dystopian Manhattan with, with drones flying over the um, I could be wrong about that. There's ways to acclimate people to be a lot of different things. But I actually think that the drones might be the solution you're looking for because it will dramatize some of the limitations of privacy. Is my own opinion you see kind of theater. Um, I don't know if other people have other thoughts, but uh, we'll end up. You do, yeah. I, I, think, I think that's right. But I think it's part of a general trend right now where today there are so many surveillance technologies that are far more powerful um, than what you know, we could have envisioned. Well, maybe you were envisioning it, but most of us were envisioning 25 years ago. And I think that's um, you know why we're seeing some degree of renaissance in, or you know, at least a hope for a potential renaissance in Fourth Amendment law because the technology has simply gotten so powerful um, you know, that the justices of the Supreme Court, you know, for example, are quite concerned about its its potential to erode privacy that um, Americans have enjoyed for a long time and have really come to expect. Can I just show one other video? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can add that one more video. Guys. The only reason is we're going to go look at the drones. I don't think we're going to ask me about one of them a lot. And if I show this video, I want to have to repeat the same. Okay, okay. show the video, and then we're going to go. Okay, ahead. just uh, uh, this is what's this VBAT movie short, the last one. This is the, the, there's one out there that's kind of an unusual aircraft. I just want to show people how it operates so that I don't have to explain this over and over again. But uh, so the, one of our aircraft out there is a uh, development prototype that we're hoping to have as a product soon, and it hovers. This is it. It, it, it takes off and lands vertically like a helicopter. It's called a tail sitter because it sits on its tail when it's on the ground. And then it transitions into an airplane mode, which you'll see in a few seconds here in this video. Um, and uh, that's 
I just want people to see this so that they understand uh, what it can do. And we, this is an important thing for like uh, the Navy, the Marines, people who operate off of ships or out of confined areas. Notice that uh, the propeller blades aren't exposed so I can stand right next to it here. This thing's actually hovering autonomously, but I use the, the little joysticks there in these test flights just to move the GPS set point around. And this shows it transitioning to airplane mode where it goes from being that hovering thing to being, uh, well, unfortunately, it looks a lot like a cruise missile. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it very fast. It has no trouble going like a, over 100 miles an hour. You know. So it's, it's kind of an unusual uh, airplane. There, there's, this is the only one of its kind uh, out there. We think this is you know, going to be an interesting product for uh, the way these things operate. So I just want people to see that. And yeah. that's it. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much. <laughs>